All right, uh, the lesson tonight is what grace produces, and actually it, it, it follows well with uh, what Marty was uh, talking about uh, this morning. Um, I've, I, I like to preach about grace. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it's what Christianity is about, about God's grace. And so far I've talked mainly about the road that one travels to get to God's grace and the, the nature of grace and the difference between grace and law, you know, how people confuse those two or try to mix the two many times. Just a, a little bit of review here, some of the things that we've learned about uh, concerning grace. First of all, grace is basically God's merciful attitude towards sinful man. You know, someone said, well, what is, what is great? Well, it's, it's how God is. He's, he's gracious, how he, how he sees us, his attitude towards us. We talked about uh, the fact that grace is embodied and personified, uh, personified rather, in Jesus Christ. Want to see what grace looks like? Look at Jesus. You, you see what grace is like in a, in, a, in a human being. Grace personified. Grace has always been God's attitude towards man in both the Old and New Testament. I've heard people say, you know, well, in the Old Testament, God dealt with man you know, based on law. In the New Testament, he based on grace. No. You know, God has always been gracious to man. Man has always been saved by a system of faith because of, of, uh, of grace. Grace uh, is also extended to us freely because of God who is, not because of who we are. I think that was brought out quite clearly this morning, or what we do, not at all what uh, moves God to, to save us. What moves Him to save us is his grace, his gracious attitude. That's what moves him to save us. Uh, also, grace is responsible for everything that God has done. If you want to go that far, the creation, giving the law, sending Jesus, giving us the Holy Spirit, creating the church, offering eternal life, all of that, all stems from you know, the wellspring of, of, of God's grace. And grace is a power that enables us to do things that we wouldn't do before. We would never think of doing things like we do now. Why? Because, of, because God's grace has touched us. And of course, God, uh, excuse me, grace is the reason or the motivation for our salvation. Why? Because God is gracious. It's not the method of our salvation. The method of our salvation is vicarious atonement, you know, the innocent you know, being sacrificed for the guilty. That, that's the method of salvation. Grace is the, is, the, is the motivation for salvation. And grace is not the way salvation is received. Grace is received and salvation is received by faith. And that faith expressed in repentance and baptism. I think in these seven ideas here, we kind of covered, you know, uh, covered the, uh, the topic that uh, I've been talking about for several months. Well, tonight we're going to look at some of the things that grace produces in us, the things that grace enables us to, uh, to achieve. Uh, go to Hebrews uh, chapter 11, uh, if you will. I'm going to read a couple of passages from there. Hebrews 11 is referred to as the, um, the heroes of the faith chapter. It reviews the history of the Jews and describes the great accomplishments and sacrifices that God's people performed because of and by their faith. And so we read first uh, Hebrews uh, 11 beginning in verse one, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith Though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death 
and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And then a little further down in verse 32, we continue reading, and what more shall I say, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. And so these men and women that are spoken of here uh, were heroes, but they were heroes uh, not of, uh, in the modern sense, heroes. Today, heroes are self-reliant and they're physically powerful. Those are the heroes that we read about and that we see in movies. These heroes here, their heroism was not based on the great things that they did, but rather based on the great things that God's grace did through them because of their faith. That's why they're heroes. That's why they're called the heroes of faith. The uh, common thread that uh, bound all of these people together and binds them to us today are these. First, they were people who believed. They didn't just believe in faith or believe in religion, they believed God. I didn't say they believed in God, they believed God and what he said and he lived by it. If God said this, they believed that. There's a big difference in believing in God where you can discuss religion and God, you know, yak, 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 you know. That's believing in God. But these people, they believe God. In the Old Testament, you know, there's, uh, there's no apologetics, if you notice, if you're into apologetics, you know, the defense of the faith, the defense of the belief that there is a God and so on and so forth. In the Old Testament, there is no apologetics. They assume that you know, God was there. It begins, you know, it begins with God. And so these people believed God. Secondly, they were profoundly convicted of their sins. Each of these recognized that they were sinners. They were unworthy of God. Many initially refused to serve God because they believed themselves unworthy. Moses, for example, and Gideon. Many of the, quote, heroes were men, were women who said, not me, me, you're choosing me? No, surely you've made a mistake, God. This is one common theme that they had. We see it even today many times when we go uh, speak to men about them becoming deacons or elders, for example. And, and, and more often than not, the first reaction is, you want me to serve as a deacon or an elder? No, I can't do that. Really, me? You know, they, yeah, there's a certain humility, quality, quotient uh, that, that's there, that needs to be there, I think, important. Well, it was the same thing with these people. Another thing is they appreciated God's grace. Their awareness of their sins enabled them to appreciate and rejoice in God's mercy and grace. The one is related to the other. Again, I mean, it's as, if, it's as if Marty and I sat down and he wrote part one and I wrote part two, but you know. People appreciate God's grace. You can't, you know, the, the most beautiful quality in a person is appreciation. People who appreciate, it's natural in them. What is it that, what is it the, one of the first things that we teach our children when they're small? To say, thank you, right? Say thank you, say thank you. you know, why? 
We want to cultivate the, this element of, of gratitude in them. Why? Because it's such a beautiful quality. So hard to live with a person who doesn't have a sense of gratitude, even a sense of gratitude for small things. And so these people appreciated God's grace. And then grace enabled them to do great things because of their faith. Grace is the single strongest motivator in the Christian's life. And if you doubt, you know, if you doubt that, take a look at people's lives and the things that they did because they were touched by God's grace. We share the same God, the same Lord, the same faith, and we are motivated today by the very same grace as the individuals that I've mentioned a few moments ago. Of course, time and circumstances have changed, but God's grace continues to produce great fruit in our lives. And I'd like to describe some of these tonight as a part of my lesson. First of all, grace produces graciousness. I know, it's a little strange. Grace produces graciousness. I'll tell you why I put that as a, as, as a title, as one of the things that grace produces. Once a person accepts grace, what do I mean by that? To accept God's grace, a person must accept the embodiment of God's grace towards man, and that's Jesus Christ. So when you accept Jesus Christ, when you accept that He is the Son of God, that He is your Lord, that He is divine, when you accept that, in essence, you're accepting God's grace. Because that's what God has sent to man. He's embodied the grace that he has, that he is in a person, in his son. And when we accept his son, we also accept God's grace. When we believe in Jesus, when we repent of our sins, when we confess our faith and are baptized, we are in effect accepting God's grace because that's his plan, that's his way to save us. Once we accept God's grace in this way, we begin to act in a gracious way. For example, when we accept Jesus as a gift, we then can begin to follow him as a role model. When I was a kid, I wanted to be like my dad. You know my story, I didn't realize, you know, I wasn't old enough to understand, eh, maybe that's not such a good thing to you know, emulate a guy like that who's, who's in the mob. You know? maybe, maybe you ought not to do that. But when I was a kid, I thought that was, that was fine. What was wrong with that? That was good. I wanted to be like him. When I knew Christ, I wanted to be like him. He's the one I wanted to be like. Through the power of Christ, that is grace's embodiment, we begin to be like him in word and in deed. Paul tells us this in Ephesians 4.24. This new gracious life he describes, that Paul describes, grace produces a change in us which is evident not only to us, but to people around us. I, I, I had a, an, an old girlfriend, she must be old by now, because uh, <laughs> I knew her long before I knew my wife. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and then I didn't see her for a long time. I mean, I, I knew her when I was not a Christian, and she wasn't a Christian. And then I didn't see her for years and years. And then one day uh, she was having problems and so on and so forth. And uh, she asked if she could talk to me and uh, visit with me. And so, and Lise was there and she said, sure, go. You know? And I brought another brother with me you know, we, we, to, to see her. 
And I spoke with her. She saw me and blah, 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 and this and that. And she said to me, she said, you've changed. And I said, yeah, I have. And I was actually feeling good. She said, you've changed. And I thought for sure she was going to say, boy, you know, you, you're like Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And she says, yeah, you're changed. She said, you're not cool anymore. <laughs> that, was a, that was a sort of a compliment. I sort of get what she was meaning. She, what she meant was, you're not worldly anymore. You don't seem to care about the world anymore. And she was right. I had changed. Grace had changed me. I had brought a, a brother with me to make sure that everything would be okay, that nothing unseemly uh, would even, you know, no one could say anything about my attempt to help this, uh, at the time, this young woman. My, my wife knew that I was going and where I was going and why I was going. I, that was not cool in the eyes of the world. But as a Christian husband, that's what Christian husbands do. That's the way they act. And so grace produces a change in us, which is evident to other people, even if they can't quite put their finger on it in the world. If there's no change, it means there's no grace working in our lives. That's all. Secondly, grace produces gratitude. The mother of all virtue is gratitude. The opposite of pride is not humility. The opposite of pride is gratitude. Because when you're proud, you don't think anybody, you, know, you don't have to thank anybody for anything. You, know, you did it all yourself. I don't need anybody. When you're proud, that's the attitude. I don't, I don't need anybody. Christianity begins with the gift of grace. Everything else that happens in our lives happens after we've received the gift. Everything good. In other words, we don't work our way to it. We work our way from it. Gratitude can be defined in a couple of ways. First of all, through appreciation. We appreciate what we have been given. We express it in our words, in our feelings, in our actions. Sometimes people say, you know, I, I, I don't know how to pray. I've forgotten how to pray. I just don't know what to say anymore. And I tell them, start by saying thank you. That's a good place to start. Start by saying, dear Lord, thank you, and then start filling in the blanks. And if you really can't think of anything, then say, just look at your body and say, thank you, I can still blink. <laughs> thank you, I, my brain is telling my lungs to breathe in and out without me having to do anything. Thank you for that, because you know what? There are people that don't have that. Thank you that my heart is beating at a regular rate, that I don't have to take my blood pressure every hour or, you know, thank you for that. Thank you that I can walk and talk and hear and think. That's just the beginning. Thank you for my house, thank you for my dog, thank you for my this, thank, you know, just start by saying thank you. Gratitude is also seen in dependence. I know we don't like that word either, do we? Dependence. Appreciation recognizes weakness and the need that gave rise to the gift in the first place. In other words, uh, I recognize that I'm dependent on God's grace. Because every once in a while, every once in a while, I tried to do it on my own. 
I pull away from grace and I see what I can do on my own. And I'm good for a while. <laughs> and then I realize, yeah, I need God's grace. I need it. I, I can't go to Him and speak to Him. I can't ask Him for anything unless I understand that I am under His grace. We still need, even after we receive the gift, you know, people often reject the gospel because they don't want to be beholden to God or to anyone. Some people just don't want to say thank you. If they were, they'd have to say thank you. Worse still, they might have to obey. <laughs> it's not so hard to obey one who is so gracious. Didn't Jesus say, my burden is light? The burden that Jesus puts on us, His yoke, it's not a heavy yoke. It's not the yoke of law. It's the burden of gratitude. It's not so hard to carry the burden of gratitude. Gratitude is also expressed in well-being. Being humbled allows one to be exalted and being exalted enables one to feel at peace with oneself and other people. Having humbled myself to receive mercy kills my pride and also helps me to be merciful to other people. This attitude brings peace of mind and spiritual well being because I am not constantly striving to be number one and I can now more easily forgive others who are trying to be number one. I'm not in that race anymore. What a relief. I'm not in that race anymore to be better than you. What a relief. Thank you, Lord. I can just be me, the one that you love, the one that you saved. That's good enough. It's, it's good enough. The antidote to the blues and to depression, to fear and to worry is gratitude. And gratitude for grace is the highest level of gratitude one can reach because it is gratitude for the most precious of gifts. The gift of grace. Another thing that grace produces Assurance, assurance. You know that saying, once saved, always saved? Once saved, always saved. Sounds so good. It does, it's as a saying, man, once saved, always saved. You know, as, as preachers say, that'll preach. The only problem is, it's wrong. <laughs> Sorry. It's just wrong. See, once saved and always saved, that's our friends in the evangelical world. And you know, we poke a little humor there for them. But we have to look at ourselves. Because a lot of times, you know what our saying is? Once saved, but never sure. That's our saying. Once saved, but never sure. I don't think, did you even mention this this morning? You know, some people going around and they, they've been Christians. I've been a Christian, you know, 41 years. Really good. So if you, yeah, if you were to die right now and go to heaven, would you go? 
And they go, well, I, I hope so, you know, I, th I think so, I, I, I'm not sure. I've mentioned this, this I know, I've mentioned before, I had a class on grace and uh, where there was feedback and uh, I gave, a, a, I gave a, a questionnaire out, zero to 10, how safe, how saved do you feel from zero to 10? Zero is, I feel utterly lost, you know, that's zero. And 10 is, I can't wait to get to heaven. I just can't wait till the Lord gets back, zero to 10. And I, and, and I said, put a circle around where, you know, how you feel. The average, six. Six. I get it if you're, you, know, you were baptized uh, you know, three months ago, oh, maybe, you know. But you've been coming to church and you've listened to a thousand sermons and you're a six? That's our problem. Once saved, but never sure. I don't know which is better. I don't know which delusion is better because they're both equally wrong. In fighting against the false idea that once you're saved, nothing you will do can ever change that has caused us many problems. This doctrine is based on the false notion that God chooses you for salvation regardless of your personal choice. You have no say in the matter. If this is true, then it follows that once you're saved in this way, you cannot be lost. Well, yeah, sure, if that's, if that's what's accurate. However, the Bible teaches that man does have a say in his salvation. Joshua 24, 15 says, choose this day who you will serve. Choose this day. That sounds like free will to me. And in Acts 2.38, you know, Peter, uh, the, the first sermon ever preached, he could have said anything at that time, but what did he say when they said to men and brethren, well, what do we do to be saved? And what does he tell them, the very first word? Repent. What does that mean, repent? Turn around, make a choice, make up your mind which way you're going to go. I like to say we have absolute free will. And people say, what, what do you mean by absolute free will? We have absolute free will because we have free will to the extent that we can say no to God. And if you can say no to God, you've got absolute free will. It's a heavy responsibility. It's a great gift. It's a great gift. If we have a say in the beginning, then we have a say throughout our lives unto the end that we want to remain saved. What does Jesus say in Matthew 10, 22? The one who endureth to the end shall be saved. What is he saying? Use your free will every day to renew your faith and you continue doing that, you will be in heaven. You will be in heaven. God promises to all who believe and want to be saved that they will be saved and nothing will touch them and he provides his grace as the guarantee that this will be so. You see, absolute free will without grace, <laughs> oh boy. Because absolute free will doesn't mean absolute error-free free will. But absolute free will with God's grace equals confidence. Confidence that God is saving us and will continue to save us until it's time for us to meet him. This type of promise from God produces confidence 
assurance that despite our difficulties and failures, if we want to, He's going to save us. How many people here want to be saved? Say amen. amen. That's it. You've just exercised your absolute free will. I'm saying to you, if you want, if that's what you want, then God will give it to you. And nothing, nothing will stop His will from completing His promise to all of us who want to be saved. One other thing here about what grace produces, it produces the aroma of Christ. Christians are not only the salt of the earth, they are also the sugar as well. When the love of Christ is seen in us, the message will be heard. It's what Paul refers to in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 17. The grace of God produces graciousness, gratitude, assurance in our lives, and these qualities are in desperate supply in this world. It is the aroma of these things in our lives that affect and provoke others to notice us. What's different about this person? Well, they're assured. What's different about them? They're always grateful. They're grateful for life. They're thankful for their families. They're thankful for everything. What's different about that guy? He knows he's going to heaven. He rejoices in the fact that he's going to heaven. In the first century, there were no organized evangelism programs. Evangelism isn't a program, it's a life. That's what it is, it's a life. It's who you are. Not something you do on Tuesday nights. Nothing wrong with having evangelism efforts in the church, you know, get stuff out into the community, whatever, yeah. But evangelism is, is it's your life. What good is it? What good is it that on Tuesday night you go out and knock on doors and you put stuff in people's mailboxes, but you only feel 60% sure that you yourself are going to heaven. Well, uh, well, what's up with that? Why bother? So we, can, so we can share with somebody else so they can be 60% sure that they're going to heaven? I mean, think now. If a person knows you and, and is around you and hears you and sees for themselves the confidence that you have in, 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 in your salvation and the gratitude that you have for it and what it does to motivate you to do good and to, to, to rejoice, that's, that's the evangelism that'll win their souls. That's the thing that'll make them want to know what is it that you have that I don't have? The aroma of our Christian character draws attention. It draws curiosity. It draws people to search for the source of this aroma. And when they come near, they find out that it's grace, grace in the person of Jesus Christ that smells so sweetly. That's why I say it's not just the salt of the earth, but we're also the sugar of the earth. I'm not saying that we don't need to you know, have, as I say, some organized way of teaching and, and, and converting people, only that without a gracious life, our words and lessons will not have any impact. People are not impressed with your program, they're impressed with your life. Grace in you is what draws them to seek for grace in themselves. How can I be sure, they say. How can I be assured, they say. They're not, these of course, are not the only things that grace produces in your life. There are other things, maybe I'll talk about another time. I began with these to make you aware of the fact that grace is not only something you receive, 
you know, God's mercy to forgive sins, but it's also a dynamic force in your life that produces tangible results. Who, excuse me, also the things mentioned, graciousness, gratitude, assurance, aroma, or influence, are not produced in any other way than through a personal experience of God's grace in your life. Can't do these things any other way. The absence of these things is usually a sign that you are either don't understand grace or secretly you reject God's grace. Grace, therefore, begins to work at baptism. That's why baptism is so important. You know, people say to us, oh, you people, you talk about baptism. You know, well, because it's so important, so very important. How important is something that God mentions 10 times in one book? You think that might be important? So I finish out my lesson by inviting you. I think I'm, you know, I'm preaching to the choir tonight, but if anyone here has not yet confessed Christ and repented of their sins and been buried in the waters of baptism, uh, we encourage you to do that tonight. And if, uh, you've, uh, if you've fallen away from grace, if you've, if you've depended more on yourself than you're depending on God's grace, that might be a subject of prayer that you might enter into for yourself or perhaps the church can pray for you. And of course, if you have any other spiritual need at this time, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.